Hi, everyone. I'm glad to be uh, introducing Senator Skinner and stepping in a little bit. Um, I am a graduate of uh, Stanford a long time ago in HumBio, so I'm always happy to help out. And I've had um, several affiliations with Stanford. I used to be an actual um, senior researcher with the Precord Institute. I continue as a member of George Schultz's Energy and Climate Task Force and a scholar with the Bill Lane Center. And I was a state policymaker in California with the California Public Utilities Commission. I'm going to go ahead and introduce, just talk about, I don't have a slide for this, uh, your speaker today, because I want to make sure as soon as she's ready um, to come on, we've got her ready to go. So I've had the honor of knowing Senator Skinner probably 40 years that I actually live in Berkeley, and she um, was very active in a host of things in Berkeley, and she became a member of the assembly, and I was one of her constituents, and then she became a member of the state Senate, and I continue to be a very proud constituent. She is absolutely a leader in California and frankly internationally on climate and clean energy. Um, it's not on the blurb that was sent around, but one of her early achievements was she set up an NGO called ICLEI, um, which was basically to get local governments involved in climate action. And this again was 25 years ago. And it was the first time somebody focused on let's get local governments involved. And from there, she's had just a host of bills that she has sponsored. Um, she has chaired many of the most influential committees in the California legislature on both the budget and on the environment. So I'm going to leave it to Senator Skinner to tell us what's going on um, in California these days. But think of her as a voice of knowing not just California, but nationally and internationally on sort of what are the leading edge policies and programs to adopt for clean energy and climate. So I'm taking up my little time that I now have because Senator Skinner um, had to is going to have to join us a little bit late. And as soon as she's ready to come in, we'll stop. But I decided instead of trying to talk about um, some of the pending things in California, because Senator Skinner will talk about. I may talk about a very precise area that I've been um, involved with and studying recently, and it's called extreme heat. And this is probably something most of you have never thought of. And what's interesting is there is not a definition of extreme heat. Um, because it depends upon the location it's happening, the duration of it, is it a single day and multi-days, and sort of a host of um, weather patterns. Generally, it's something at least 100 degrees or more. And the point being with climate change, you may think mostly about drought, or you think about flooding, or you think about wildfires, but extreme heat is one of the worst impacts that we are now experiencing from climate change. Deaths happen because of extreme heat, because vulnerable people get affected. There's a lot of health issues, um, uh, visits to the emergency room, productivity is impacted. We have a lot of outdoor workers, construction, agriculture, and it's darn hard to be working when it's 104 degrees. And natural resource impacts. And Professor Wyan and I were just talking, and I was thrilled to learn that he has a project going on in this area, actually about the impacts of um, extreme heat on agricultural production and productivity. So point everyone to uh, Professor Wyan if you want to get involved in that area. Um, one of the other really concerning things is this happens in terms of populated areas almost always in low income areas, because study after study shows they don't have trees shading the neighborhood and they don't have air conditioned houses and they may not have well insulated houses as well. So it's something that is sort of this triple whammy of it's really focused on the low income disadvantaged communities. Um, there was an assessment um, by California recently that said by 2050, Extreme heat is going to be costing the state at least $100 billion a year. And so I didn't get a number for right now, but this is not a small issue. So that's what I really want to say. It, you may not have heard of it, but you're going to be hearing about it. 
Next slide. There we go. So California, not surprisingly, is a leader in this area that there was a budget deal that was worked out last year that basically is giving us about $800 million over three years to implement what's called the California Extreme Heat Action Plan. And that's by far the biggest amount of funding that we're seeing anywhere, at least in the United States. And there's a lot of different agencies involved. I won't try to go through them, but those agencies have to plan what to do, develop programs. Good news is there is money for research. So I wanted to target especially those students here and faculty that this is an area that actually has some money um, to be doing research because it is so new in the thinking. There are grants for education, for adaptation. And in terms of adaptation, we have a lot of the technology fans, heat pumps, air conditioners, and what we call cool services, white roofs or lightly colored um, roofs. Pavements are a big area now because our cities are so paved over, but there's new materials being developed. And even on walls, thinking about the paint that's used. But again, this is an area where we need a lot more technology and a lot more understanding of how effective is the technology. But there still are really some major gaps in programs and agency coordination because bottom line is there is no single agency in California or frankly at the federal level or anywhere that's in charge of thinking about and dealing with extreme heat. And then sort of the flip side is it's really actions at the local level and by individuals that have to deal with this that um, in a city, it is the local building department that will be looking at what is the pavement that can be put in. Um, uh, you also have what are the permits that are required in terms of roofs. So there's a lot of um, action locally and then individually. Can I think about if I'm gonna finally get an air conditioner that I get the most efficient air conditioning? How am I gonna make that decision? Who's gonna help me in making it? So huge amounts of effort that are needed, but it's, it's really starting to get attention. Next slide, please. Um, so then there are two important bills in the legislature that I wanted to mention, and I don't think Senator Skinner is gonna be talking about them because they're in the assembly and she's a Senator, but AB, which stands for Assembly Bill 2076 and 2238, um, it would establish, among these, they would establish um, a new program right in the governor's office in the Office of Planning and Research, or OPR. And then within that, there's another group called the Strategic Growth Council, um, SGC, that's really done some great work in my mind with local communities. So we would have finally sort of a place where this lives, and it would be called the New Extreme Heat and Community Resilience Program. Um, but there would also be a lot of work with two other agencies. One would be with the um, uh, Natural Resources Agency because there's a lot of need to green up our cities and especially areas that are poor that don't have trees or canopies. And so they would be hosting a lot of the effort in that area. And then the third major agency, at least in my mind, is one you, unless you're involved in this, you're not gonna know. It's called Communities Services, CSD, Community Services and Development, it handles a lot of the low income energy programs and rate relief programs. And so they're going to have a major role since the communities of our low income areas are so impacted by this. But this is a major thing, getting a whole new program set up. They will be given them the authority to be giving out grants and technical assistance. And I just wanna say again, this is an area that I think is ripe for researchers and academic experts to be helping out that I work with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab has a heat island group where their work in this area is um, uh, situated. And they really are sort of an expert on call when some new, like the city of Phoenix is uh, getting very involved in this, San Francisco is. When you're trying to think of what to do, how do you know what the performance is? How do you evaluate it? This is an area where you want unbiased experts. And I'm really hoping we'll get a group going in at Stanford as well. Um, the, Bills call for development of a statewide extreme heat ranking system. And that's because we don't know sort of 
just off the top of the head, what do we mean? And so the, the talk is to develop something like what we have for hurricanes and our other adverse weather events so that there would be a way of saying, you know, we're in code red on extreme heat or we're going to be looking at code yellow. And these are the areas that are going to be affected. Um, nothing like this exists that we know of, so it's going to take a lot of effort of thinking about it. But we've got to have a way that we then can communicate to the public, be prepared. This heat is coming. Here's how long we think it may last. And here are the steps that you um, can be taking. The other part, and this is, I think, important to say, this is not just engineering or public policy. There's a huge amount on public health. And again, Stanford with its wonderful um, uh, uh, hospital and whole healthcare system, I think could be a major player because um, it would call for developing a hospitalization and death reporting system. So we really start to understand what are these horrible impacts, but it's not clear sort of how that system is going to be developed, how those reports are going to be made. If you also have a heart attack, sort of like with COVID, what do you say are the causes? And um, very, very important to think then how we target our efforts, uh, but it's going to take a lot of work. And then interesting, the Department of Insurance in California is likely to get involved. They're going to be called upon to put in an extreme heat cost report because there are lots of costs for this, but we're not sure at all now who's paying for them. And eventually it is believed there will be insurance coverage to, um, for these events, but we have to start with understanding what are the costs, what are the causes, and who's paying. And possibly we um, may be looking at more funding. There have been very specific requests made to increase it, but we don't know yet if that's going to be happening. So I think that is the end of what I prepared. If Senator Skinner um, is not around, I am more than happy to talk if that's what folks want me to do or answer questions. Uh, any, any questions on, on what uh, Diane just presented for her illustrious career at the PUC and at Stanford? <laughs> yeah, you can ask me anything. <laughs> you know, when she was at the PUC, Diane was for many years, I hope I got this right, the kind of leading voice on energy efficiency. You want to talk about that and uh, how, how you orchestrated that whole effort here? At <laughs> sure. Um, just off yeah. the top of your head. Yeah, right. No, I actually just talked with um, Jeff St. John of Canary Media today about energy efficiency. So I wore that hat for a couple hours today. Um, California was where energy efficiency was developed. And frankly, Senator Skinner was very important in that area. We developed the first building codes, um, appliance standards. We did the first utility programs. When I had the good fortune um, to become a commissioner at the PUC, we were overseeing over a billion dollars in spending that was raised from rates that utility customers pay that the utilities then administered. And there was 200 separate programs. And what I became concerned with is that we didn't have a good plan for where we were going. And I said, billion dollars a year, 10 years, that's $10 billion. If we were a corporation, somebody would have a strategic plan. So we developed a strategic plan, which I'm Happy to say is, you know, continue to be implemented in various ways. Some of the most interesting new developments in efficiency, I think, are that we have a lot of effort going into building decarbonization and specifically heat pumps and getting them out there and getting contractors um, involved in that. Uh, the other thing is the data analytics. And I had a great um, pleasure while I've been at Stanford and even now working with Professor Rishi Jain, J-A-I-N. So if anyone's in, is interested in buildings, efficiency, and data analytics, he's your go-to person doing some really wonderful, wonderful work um, in this area. But we are starting to see now in the private marketplace, private companies that have, as an example I gave this morning, was just one company, Enerby, that it has what's called an online marketplace that if you go on to, it's a state-sponsored website, PAFTA, which I won't try to talk, tell you what it's about, but you actually can then put in, if you are thinking, oh, I need a new air conditioner or my water heater died and I got to get one today, 
Um, it, it very much develops algorithms that look at your location, your interest, uh, have you go to the least, exp to the most efficient appliances, um, and you can then also do it by cost, et cetera. And they partnered with contractors and companies. So Best Buy helps out. And the important thing I think is that it, it then offers very low cost financing. So what it's doing is micro loans that we have not seen in the state before that somebody can get up to a five-year loan um, for a new furnace or a new air conditioner. There's automatic um, transfer of payment monthly from a checking account. The default rates appear to be very, very little. And you can qualify with extremely low credit scores. So we're starting to penetrate, we hope, the renter's market and low, um, low income. So that's just an example of how we wouldn't have known how to do this um, five years ago without the great data analytics that have developed. And then thinking through sort of what's the marketing and having then instant feedback about what's working and what isn't. So, that's an example of what excites me in, in this area. Is this a good example to advance cooling that can decarbonize us? Yes, that's what we're talking about is um, heat pumps, put, getting more and more heat pumps put in that will cool um, split systems. So they both heat and, and cool. And it says another question, should we, I'm gonna just keep talking, John, until you tell me not to, shall we, Reconsider earth sheltering housing and other buildings as we did experimentally in Alaska 10 years ago. Um, I am certainly not an expert in this area, but I think how we're going to be looking at the housing we build um, may change dramatically over the next decade as we understand. There's no standard, for example, um, for how cool buildings have to be. <laughs> Whereas on the heat side, there are state laws all over the map that if you have a house or an apartment, its furnace or other equipment needs to be sufficient that it can heat you to, I don't know what you know the standard is, but some level of standard so that people aren't getting too cold or getting sick. And so what's being talked about is we probably need to develop some standards for our buildings for the cooling aspect. And that again, will open up a whole nother level, I think, of thinking about how we are building the buildings and what our technologies are going to be. Would engineering student projects to design new types of easily installed efficient low power cooling heating pumps be useful in California? Absolutely. Um, with our new school coming out, um, it's going to have, as I understand, a lot of focus on doing student-led or student-involved projects that can then be implemented and tested out. And this is an area where all hands on board, um, and I'm sure there's people connected, but if not, somebody can figure out how to get in touch with me. Do I have any thoughts on the current heat wave in California? I am not familiar with what's going on, though I've done work in India, and that's, you know, in some ways, the problems in California are so small compared to places like India and other places that have these terrible, terrible um, heat issues. But we work closely with India and other places, and so some of our solutions hopefully can be adopted. Um, with it, prices increasing, how will people stay, stay cool? That's... <laughs> That's a big problem. And that's why there's talk about, oh, there's Senator Skinner. Hello. <laughs> I'm going to immediately stop. Can you Hi, Diane. Great. Well, I, I took the time. They asked me to talk. So you know what I just did was a primer on California extreme heat efforts in Great. California. Because I figured, it well, you know, I didn't at all get into anything else going on in California. So please talk. We're delighted to have you. Thank you. And I don't need to remind all of you who are part of this that the climate crisis is real and it's already upon us. Um, so, you know, fortunately, California has been more of a leader than most every other government in the U.S. in terms of taking it seriously and advancing policies and programs to reduce emissions. What we've done a little less on, but we're starting to amp this up, is in the area of adaptation and uh, investments that to help California be more resilient. And now we're realizing 
that we have to, because look at these wildfires that we're experiencing, look at our ongoing droughts. Um, California's always had droughts. It's not new, but it's much more challenging. The, the high heat extremes, the, uh, you know, you can get a record snowfall like we did this year, but then it melts immediately. Then we do not have the water storage capacity. We don't get the slow um, runoff uh, melting of the snow that normally would uh, provide us the water ongoing. So, you know, we're, and of course, sea level rise. So we're right in the middle of, in real time, experiencing these impacts, which are only going to be aggravated. Um, but let's get back to this, the realness of the crisis. What, now, personally, I've been involved in this issue since about 1990. And I started a program called Cities for Climate Protection, where back in the 90s, we were recruiting cities all over the world to make commitments, to make decisions that they were going to set goals for GHG reduction, that they would do inventories of emissions in their communities, and they would do inventories as to what, how their policies impacted those emissions. So in other words, were they adopting policies that increased emissions? or were they adopting policies that would help reverse them? And so I was counting carbon back in the 90s and for all through the 90s and even up through you know, 2010, 2015, then we had high resistance to, adapt, to pushing adaptation because we really wanted to stop the climate crisis. We wanted to reverse those emissions and avoid that, that the most catastrophic impacts. Well, I still hope that we can avoid the most catastrophic but we're in it now. And did I believe that when I started in this work that in my lifetime, I would so, so immediately experience these climatic changes? No, no. And I can tell you just from someone who hikes a lot, the, just the, the um, changes in places where I used to go and have wildflowers at a certain time of year or certain species that don't exist or places that I snorkel, where the coral is all dead and various things that did I, sure, I knew that those were potential impacts, but did I think that I would personally experience them? No. So we have got to double down on emissions reductions, no questions, double down, but it's not gonna be enough. We also have to do everything we can to capture carbon. And when I say that, I mean, not just within those things that are emission producing, and I'll explain a bill that I'm carrying right now on cement, for example, which has process emissions, that even if you switch cement over to the, if you even you were uh, powering your cement production with 100% renewable energy, you would still be producing process emissions because of the nature of the content of cement. So we got to capture that, but we also have to maximize nature's ability to capture. When I say that, I mean, that's clearly what we talk about when we say protect forests, protect the Amazon, but there's also great capacity within soils. Soils are alive, at least the optimal soil. And if we can bring back that regenerative, regenerative practice, whether it's in ag, agriculture practices or even grasslands, forests, you name it, to keep soil alive, the microorganisms in soil have great capacity to capture carbon. There's also a lot of research now showing that, that uh, fungus, mycorrhizal, uh, mycorrhizae from fungus has great capacity for this, as do, of course, um, microorganisms in our oceans and waterways and plants. So we need to understand that better and maximize that capture or sequestration of carbon, as well as direct air capture, which is only being really experimented with. There are, you know, some places, you know, projects in Iceland, a project in Germany, a project here and there, but it's not yet commercially viable, but we've got to send the right type of market signals to get the research and the development because we've got to pull carbon out of the air at the same time where you're doubling down on emissions reductions to really avoid the most catastrophic. And now is California doing all of that yet? No, but 
the um, Governor Newsom in the budget that he proposed in January, and he will be revising that proposal in May. But in January, you saw, and you can see if you go up on the governor's website, that he's proposing some very, very significant investments to, to completely transform our transportation sector so that vehicles are ZEV, zero emission, primarily electric. And he's putting a lot of money towards electric vehicle infrastructure, charging infrastructure, and also support for people to be able to purchase electric vehicles and convert to electric vehicles. Um, but the, uh, the other um, things that the governor had in his January budget along these lines are 100 million for green hydrogen electrolyzers. So we can use renewable energy that we, at times when we're overproducing it, to then produce hydrogen. Um, money for offshore wind, and there's some spots around the California coast that are really good for offshore wind. 380 million for long duration storage, which we're hoping will be beyond just battery, but certainly battery has a huge role. And we have utility grade batteries now for long, for, they're a little shorter duration. We want, we obviously need longer duration. Hydrogen is a great uh, capacity for long duration storage as some other things. And he's put in a billion for building decarbonization. And what I'm expecting is that when the governor puts out his budget for May, that he will be building on those. He won't be reducing any of those, but we may see some additional investments because revenues are up right now. Now, in the meantime, the uh, Air Resources Board, California Air Resources Board, which is the agency responsible to basically put together the plans and implement most of California's very ambitious uh, climate protection goals, including AB 32, SB 30, um, SB, what was the number? Um, 32. Are, <laughs> 32. 32. I mean, AB 32, yeah. SB 30. SB 32, which doubled up. So AB 32 had a, was very ambitious when it was adopted back in 2007, but the, uh, but SB 32 doubles up those and gets us an even bigger uh, GHG reduction target. And then of course, there's targets around carbon neutrality and uh, zero emission vehicles and various things like that, most of which are in the responsibility of the Air Resources Board to develop the programs and plans for implementation. So how the Air Resources Board does that primarily is through something they call the scoping plan. And CARB just updated the scoping plan for California. It's on their website now. They just released their newest version. And their plan is to get California to be carbon neutral by 2045. And in that scenario, that scoping plan scenario, they include reliance on both emissions reductions and natural and what I'll call for now technological carbon sequestration or carbon capture. So exactly what I was talking about before. Um, now I'm the budget chair for the state Senate and the state Senate, we have the R pro tem, Tony Atkins, Senator Tony Atkins, decided that she wanted the Senate to be very ambitious and aggressive around climate, the climate crisis this year. So she set up a working group in the state Senate, which is headed up by Senator John Laird. And there's a number, a lot of different senators who are participating in it. And they are rolling out bills right now. And at the same time that they're rolling out some policy bills, we're also looking at a budget plan that would add to the investments that the governor is um, arguing for. And some of the investments we're going to be um, asking for are investments that would have California, the state, put its money where its mouth is and move its own vehicles, the states, the vehicles we purchase to ZEV at a quicker timeline than we had previously. Because we figure if we're expecting the private sector to do it, then we need to use our market power to affect that, which also can help bring down prices and clearly we'll invest in infrastructure for charging because we'll need to charge those state vehicles. So we want to move that up. We also want to, we're going to put a lot of infrastructure or capital money in the whole adaptation and resiliency around drought 
around uh, improving drinking water, wildfire mitigation, including fuel reduction, um, and also sea level rise. Because if you look at a lot of California's economic engines, whether it's our ports, our airports, various others, they're all, the major ones are all on the coast and very, very vulnerable to sea level rise. So we have, we are probably going to propose sometime this week a multi, and I'm talking multi, multi billion dollar investment in those areas. Um, the Senate Working Group on Climate that I just referenced just released their first bill, and their first bill is SB 1020. And you can go on the what's called the legislative data site and see all the language for that bill. But I'll give you the highlights of what it's going to do. It accelerates our clean energy goals. So in other words, our renewable, our electricity portfolio goals for electricity purchased by the state or generated in the state to um, 100% by 2030 rather than 2045. So it jumps it up and it sets a goal of 95% renewable for all retail sales by 2040. And the existing law is 100% by 2045. And we're trying to increase the coordination between our various agencies responsible for transmission because we're going to need transmission upgrades as we expand our reliance on renewable generation for electricity and as we expand our reliance on using electricity to power vehicles and to uh, switch buildings over. Now, we don't expect all buildings to be switched over quickly to becoming all electric, but we need to plan for that and we need to get off of natural gas and you need the infrastructure to do that. Um, so that's the bill SB 1020. Everything I mentioned, only the first things are clear components of it. The other things I mentioned are gonna be more in some other bills that come forward and in the budget um, proposals that we make to add to the governor's proposals. Um, the other thing that our working group is recommending is establishing a California affordable decarbonization authority that would administer a climate and equity trust fund to help, you know, certain of these things are gonna have higher costs and we do not wanna put undue burden on our lowest income residents. And while California's revenues are really healthy, we're a very strong economy, we have a lot of residents who are still struggling and who are with our high costs of living and such, that if we, as we pursue our very important climate goals, add more cost burden to them, it can be, it's, it's really unfair. And so we want to try to, to um, establish mechanisms to help them be able to participate in this decarbonized economy and society in a way that doesn't hurt their quality of life um, in the short term. Now, I'll jump over to the bills that I've introduced this year on this question, meaning on, uh, on addressing our climate crisis. And here's the bills that I'm carrying this year. I have SB, and just putting it in a context, I have not carried, um, I've been in the legislature since 2008. So I came in after our first really big signature bill, which was AB 32. But I was a core part of the negotiations around our, all of our renewable portfolio standards. And our renewable portfolio standards is that RPS is the term for our goals for switching our electricity sector to renewable. So we started out first with 25%, then we went up to 50%. Now we're at the 100%. And now we're moving dates to get to that even faster. But the, some of the other bills that I've carried in the past, I'm the person that carried the bill that established California's utilities buying energy storage. So the first time that California put uh, utility grade batteries onto the, you know, within the um, utility sector, within the transmission sector was due to a bill that I carried. And at the point that I carried it, which was in 2009, people were like, you know, this will never happen. Batteries are too expensive. You can't expect this. But within very few years, California had the largest market share 
of this utility grade storage. And we completely changed the landscape around that technology and its use, not only in the California and the US, but worldwide. Um, so now I'm trying to do similar things around hydrogen and around carbon sequestration when it comes to certain industrial processes. So I'll mention, I'll describe those bills now. So I'm carrying SB 1075 on hydrogen. And the reason I'm interested in green hydrogen is because we, you know, we're trying to decarbonize everything, but you take long haul trucking, port operations, ships, planes, they're harder to electrify. We don't yet, we haven't made the breakthroughs in battery yet. Uh, I'm hoping that we will someday, but hydrogen has that capacity, but it's no good if we produce that hydrogen from fossil fuels. And given that we've really brought down the cost of the generation of electricity from renewable sources, and also those sources are at oftentimes they're generating more electricity than we need at the point that they're at their maximum generation. So wind or solar, for example, we can in effect capture that excess generation and utilize it rather than directly onto the grid, utilize it to produce hydrogen, whether it's electrolysis or other means. And then that hydrogen is very flexible. That hydrogen then can be used to store energy. That hydrogen can be used to fuel transportation, a variety of different applications. And it's one of the few renewable sources that has that different kind of flexible capacity. So 1075 jumpstarts California's use of green hydrogen. And it also uh, pushes California towards trying to invest some uh, state matching money so that we could compete with the federal government or rather we could compete for the federal dollars that were in the, uh, the infrastructure bill that got passed that is, pro is providing some funding, including for hydrogen. And I want California to maximize that and potentially have be selected as one of the hydrogen hubs. So that's the purpose of SB 1075. And then I have SB 1010, which I a little bit referenced um, which is my uh, clean fleets bill. And that is to get California we own 40,000 vehicles, and most of which are still fueled by fossil fuels. Um, so I want to accelerate the purchase of our state agency. It's called DGS, Department of Governmental Services. They're the ones who buy those vehicles. And I want to make sure that we are accelerating and amping up the date for when we will buy all ZEBs. Because when we use our market power that way, we help bring down prices and we help make it easier for others to do the same thing. So that's my bill, SB 1010. Then I've got SB 905, which would, I referenced in the opening of this uh, talk about um, the process emissions from cement manufacture. So what this bill does would allow for a few of the cement manufacturing facilities in California to pilot capturing carbon and then geologically sequestering it. And we're not doing that right now in California. So I wanna do that because there's a lot of fear around geologic sequestration. When you think about the Aliso Canyon, some of you may be familiar a few years ago, Aliso Canyon was a place where natural gas was being stored. And it, the, the thought was that, okay, this is completely, uh, this, these caverns are completely safe. They're, uh, you know, nothing's going to escape. And they started, it started escaping. And it created many, many problems. And I think it was uh, SoCal Gas that was, uh, it was their facility. I can't remember if it was Southern California Edison or SoCal Gas. And it just added to people's fear that if you, sequester carbon, it will just escape. And then people have fears that carbon itself would be dangerous in the immediate way, meaning have an immediate pollution on that neighborhood. Now, we know that that's not the case, though certainly it does for the atmosphere, but we don't, we need to pilot some projects to show that it can work and then to learn what it is we have to do to make sure that it works. So my bill SB 905 would allow 
a few California cement manufacturing facilities to pilot capturing that carbon, release from their process emissions, and store it geologically. And then lastly, I have SB 1206. Now, when I said we have to double down on emissions reductions, one of the things that I think California should do is focus on the short-lived climate pollutants. Now, when I say that, the short-lived climate pollutants are things like methane, diesel, so the dirty, the uh, black carbon, um, refrigerants like HCFCs, those short-lived climate pollutants will only have a bad effect in the atmosphere for maybe 20 years, but they're thousands of times more powerful than CO2. And if we can do everything we can to keep those out of the atmosphere in this next 10, 20 year period, we buy time for that transition to get fully off of fossil fuels. So my bill SB 1206 would move California more aggressively off the, the short-lived climate polluting refrigerants. So right now we've moved the refrigerants from 20 years ago were called CFCs. And they were very damaging to the ozone layer and they were short-lived climate pollutants. However, in replacing them, we got rid of a thing that damaged the ozone layer, but we replaced them with something that was still a short-lived climate pollutant, meaning an HFC. And what I wanna do now is try to get even away from those. And, uh, and if we can't in those applications where we can't completely eliminate its use, then require that it be captured when you repair it or when you dispose of it, that it's never released. So um, that's my bill, SB 1206. Uh, and let me see if there was anything else I wanted to, to point out. Um, back to the governor's uh, budget, I said that very significant investments in the electric vehicles and zero emission vehicles, but let me state what they are. It was his January proposal had six billion in investments for over five years, a billion for light duty vehicles, four billion for medium and heavy. So we're, we're getting into the goods movement type area and one billion for school buses and infrastructure. And I was really to, glad to see that for school buses. Um, just an important message to kids and a uh, good one. Um, so that's, what I wanted to highlight for you, and then I am happy to take questions. There is much more that California is doing. There's also much more California could be doing. And uh, maybe in our dialogue, we can uh, get into some of that. If you could wave a magic wand, <laughs> so we're not in the immediate political part of the budget and the legislature. Right. What are the barriers with our current um, government structure, do you think? You've had long history of working with a lot of different agencies. Um, I think one of the values is we have deep expertise within the agencies and you can't just reshuffle. Yeah. There's very different cultures. But are there, you know, two or three things that you think that maybe California should be working on to achieve these um, tremendously ambitious goals? I didn't plant this question, so. <laughs> okay, um, you know, that's a good question. Um, um, or do you think we're doing, it's not worth, you know, basically things are moving along and life's not perfect. I mean, that's another. Well, I, you know, life is definitely not perfect and any human endeavor, whether it's business, government, families, schools, I mean, it's human endeavor. So it's gonna have, it's foibles, right? And I actually think that our Air Resources Board is doing a great job. And I, I feel like they, there's lots, you know, anybody could complain about whatever process of a government, but they, they, when I think about what you need to do to address the climate crisis, number one, you better understand it. What's driving it? What are the emissions that are causing it? What are the sources? So that's one of the core things that ARB does in the scoping plan is they update, they do an analysis. All right, here's California's emissions profile. These are where it's coming from. So if, we're, if we are trying to achieve a 50% reduction or a 60%, we better be targeting this. Now, when you look at where are the emissions coming from, they're coming from transportation. 
that's the highest amount. Our, while I am 100% supportive of our electricity goals and moving to, um, to fully, to non-carbon, to fully renewable electricity, our electricity is the least worry, to be perfectly blunt, of, in our, if, of our carbon profile. So in other words, if I, for example, if you're a homeowner right now, I would tell you, get rid of your gas appliances before you put solar on your roof. Why? If you hadn't got solar already, the reason is because our electricity that's coming into your house already is pretty much solar. Not 100%, but close enough. It's got a very low carbon coefficient. But your water heater, your stove, and your, uh, your home heater are all gas, and there's where your carbon is. That's your carbon in the household in California by and large. So, but you think about how do you change that? And every individual, either homeowner or building owner making those changes, that's, those are, it's easier in a way to, uh, to fix the big generation of electricity, even if we really have to get at this, you know, this other thing. Um, so it's partly just the number of actors that you have in order to affect the change. And then you take the same thing about transportation. You've got all these vehicles out there, huge number of vehicles. And how is it that, I mean, most of us don't, I mean, we might love a new vehicle, but most of us will keep our vehicle for a good number of years before we switch it out. So, you know, how fast are people gonna switch over to an EV? And will they switch to the EV if they don't feel like it's easy just right there to charge it at home? Or if they feel like, you know, there's a lot of misperception about most of us don't drive that far. We really, a, an EV with a hundred mile range is more than enough for us. But of course, now today on the market, there's EVs with way longer range. So all these range anxieties are really um, not needed, but that's hard still to get a consumer to really embrace. So a lot of this is just um, trying to get at how, how, how do we make the big changes and yet still support all the individual actors, meaning you know the people in their homes or the vehicle owner or whatever to also make the changes in order to affect it. And that's not easy, right? But we're, I think ARB is doing a good, is doing a good job with always, like any of us, always room for improvement. I would say the thing that, and these are, um, you know, this, this horse got out of the wagon a long time ago, uh, but California is the reason our transportation emissions are so high. Yes, because our vehicles are dependent on fossil fuels, but because our land use policies encouraged long drives, meaning encouraged growth of VMT rather than non-growth. And when I say that, I mean, you look at the, the typical land use policy up and down California. Housing is segregated from jobs and segregated from services. So you have to take kids to school, you have to go to work, you have to get, you know, buy groceries or whatever, you know, other than now the switch to online. You had to drive all different places and you had to drive far. And by not building housing, and for 40 years, we pretty much did not build enough housing. We, we pushed housing further and further away from job centers, which of course made you dependent on your car that much more. And so, you know, the fossil fuel vehicle is never that great, but the fossil fuel vehicle where you only have to drive six miles compared to the fossil fuel vehicle where you have to drive round trip 125 each day, that's a big difference in terms of emissions. So land use policies and housing policies are two very, very core reasons why California has high emissions in the transportation sector. And those, we're working on changing those. They aren't necessarily ARB's purview, but there's enough of us in the legislature who are understanding it. We're pushing it, but local governments are not always amenable. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being here, Senator Skinner. It's an honor. Um, I have a question about something you mentioned about uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles. Uh, you mentioned the problems we have with decarbonizing them, and you also mentioned your interest in hydrogen with SB 1075, I believe. But 
But I'm also interested in what do you think the role of renewable natural gas is in this landscape of medium and heavy duty vehicles, given that um, you know, by utilizing this renewable natural gas, we would also be reducing short-lived climate forces like methane that you will also mentioned. Um, and given that California is also very interested in installing anaerobic digesters and dairies. Um, so right. just your perspective on hydrogen and renewable natural gas right. and the interaction. Well, I clearly, as I described, I clearly think we, you know, we need to use every tool in the toolbox. I think that we should be utilizing um, renewable natural gas and hydrogen. The concern about um, the renewable natural gas is there's fears by, um, on the one hand, we have a great uh, infrastructure already, pipes and, and everything to move that kind of stuff around to get it where we need it. However, the fear is that, you know, how much can we actually produce of renewable and, and are we just prolonging the use of natural gas if we in effect integrate those um, sources? And I think that's one of those questions where I feel like as long as we have clear enough goals to move off of the fossil fuel and natural gas, we should not be limiting the thing that can be utilized right away to replace it. It just, you have to have those belts and suspenders on everything, but it's been a, an area that's been a little bit stuck, I think, for some people. I see a question in the chat of who might have the responsibility for developing cool building standards. That's the Energy Commission. And uh, those are needed. And I'm glad that Diane mentioned them because they not only would help us, all of us be more comfortable in those horrible heat waves, they would contribute less the, um, my real mentor, brilliant, brilliant man, Art Rosenfeld, who um, was really the founder of all of California's efficiency policies, he and Stephen Chu, who was uh, head of DOE and Obama, they did a brilliant research that showed that just applying cool roof and other cool community strategies not only helped you know, the quality of life, but it would hugely reduce emissions because it would reduce our demand of air conditioning and other things. So it had, it was a, and Diane probably can cite the data on it better than I, but I've been disappointed that California has not been more aggressive in that area, but it's the uh, California Energy Commission who has that responsibility. One more quick question. Uh, uh, it is needed to be more aggressive. If you yeah. ever want thoughts. <laughs> Uh, hi there, uh, Senator Skinner. Um, first, thanks so much for taking time to talk to us today. Um, so my question is on uh, California's outlook on carbon offsets, uh, specifically um, in, in terms of both the, the offsets on the, the compliance market. Um, so, you know, the, the, those that are contained within the, within the cap and trade system. And then also, um, you know, over the past couple of years, we've seen the voluntary um, carbon offset markets grow quite significantly. Um, it seems like, especially with California's commitments to increase carbon removal um, and other forms of, uh, of sequestration, these offset markets are going to be very important. Um, but could, could you talk to your sort of outlook on how you think uh, these markets will best develop and what California's role um, in, 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 uh, in helping them develop uh, will be over the next sort of decade? So I'm not sure if I caught everything. Um, it was around offsets. But yeah, I was having a little hard time hearing. Maybe you could just say, so in, in essence, you wanna know what specific thing about um, the offsets? Um, just how you see the role of offsets developing in California's cap and trade um, system. You know, right now they're, right. they can be 4% of, uh, of a, a utilities uh, emissions storing to 6%. Right. Um, and then also, if you could touch on uh, how California views uh, regulating the voluntary carbon carbon offset markets. Um, right. Yeah. Um, I did a bill last year to, so there's a trend right now, a lot of companies in trying to be responsive to the climate cri crisis are indicating that they're going to be, you know, 100% carbon neutral by certain, you know, date and or the intention to go carbon neutral. And to do that for many of them, they're going to need offsets. 
And so there's the potential, and there already is a private sector market around offsets. But I wanted to make sure that there were standards and quality offsets that when a company made an investment that they, you know, you could have some integrity for the quality of those offsets. So I did a bill last year in that area asking ARB to set those, to set up such standards. Um, now, California's, there's been criticism around our both use of offsets that they haven't been the type of quality that people were hoping. Um, I have not really looked into that in detail recently, so I can't quite answer that. Though I feel that there's also been a, a strong feeling that California should only invest in offsets that benefit Californians or so more immediate to California. And part of that is around the issues of environmental justice that we have so many communities that have had to bear the burden of the environmental um, damage and environmental pollutants more than other communities. And that one, the I am not opposed to that, but when I was a, when I used to work internationally as the head of this program called Cities for Climate Protection, I was struck. So this, I'll end with this little analogy. So I had a couple of small cities from Sweden in my project. And one of the cities, I'm going to forget its name, it's a very small community, maybe 12,000 people. And they decided they were going to go 100% fossil free. And they, so they used biomass. They used, I mean, they were, they were very, very creative and very brilliant and they pulled it off. And, but they spent a lot of money. Their, their cost per capita was very high. And they were presenting what they had done to one of our workshops where we had city representatives from South Africa, from India, from various countries. And the South Africans stood up and they were aghast. They said, it's lovely that you've done this. Now, you are, now you've reduced this amount of carbon at this cost. If you had given us that same amount of money, we could have 10 times reduced the carbon in our community than what you did. And so, in effect, they were arguing for you, you know, offsets and such. Where, and it was a very interesting discussion because I had not thought of it in that context. And given that this is a global crisis, we should be thinking about where we make our investments to get the biggest reductions because the atmosphere is global. Um, but I also think equity is an important factor to it's uh, equity to do that, but it's also equity to reinvest in communities that have suffered the, the most significant brunt of your environmental problems. Great. Uh, with that said, thank you so much, uh, Senator S uh, Skinner, for that uh, rapid uh, grand tour of climate and energy policy here in California. And I think I speak for everybody here online. Thank you for your role in uh, making it all happen as both citizens and analysts. Thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. And Diane's been a great contributor to all of this also. She deserves uh, equal thanks. <laughs>